From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, Tony Morrison. I hate to say it, but from the very beginning in the maternity world, the baby embarrassed me. That's a line from the opening of Morrison's new novel, God Help the Child. It's about how children carry into adulthood the wounds inflicted by parents and by predators. When Morrison's children were young, she didn't worry much about making mistakes, but... Now that I'm in, everything has a mistake. And everything. We'll talk about how she became Toni Morrison, both in terms of acquiring her name and becoming a writer. Once, while working on her first novel with her baby on her lap, the baby spit up on her legal pad, but she was so intent on continuing. I rode around the teeth because I figured I could almost write that one, but I might not get that sentence again. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Fresh Air, and here's a suggestion. Tomorrow morning, when you want to find out what happened in the world while you were sleeping and what's likely to make news during the day, Tune into NPR's Morning Edition. To find your station schedule, just go to npr.org. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. My guest, Toni Morrison, is one of the most celebrated writers of our time. She won a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1988 for her novel, Beloved, about a former slave looking back on her life after the Civil War. In 1993, Morrison became the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. In 2012, President Obama awarded Morrison the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This year, she won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Book Critics Circle. Morrison, who is now 84, has a new novel that's just been published called God Help the Child. It begins with the line, it's not my fault. Those words are spoken by an African-American woman explaining that she has no idea why she gave birth to such a dark-skinned baby. The mother is embarrassed by her daughter's darkness and wants to distance herself. The daughter is scarred by not having her mother's love. The novel is about those childhood wounds that leave a lasting mark into adulthood. Tony Morrison, welcome back to Fresh Air. I'd like to start by asking you to do a reading from the novel. So this is from very early in the novel, where Sweetness, the mother, who is light-skinned African-American is talking about how shocking and upsetting it was to give birth to a daughter with very dark skin. As she describes it, midnight black, Sudanese black. So would you pick up from there with the reading? Sure. I hate to say it, but from the very beginning in the maternity ward, the baby, the little Anne, embarrassed me. Her first skin was pale, like all babies, even African ones, but it changed fast. I thought I was going crazy when she turned blue-black right before my eyes. I know I went crazy for a minute because once, just for a few seconds, I held a blanket over her face and pressed. But I couldn't do that, no matter how much I wished. She hadn't been born with that terrible. I even thought of giving her away to an orphan sometimes. And I was scared to be one of those mothers who put their babies on church steps. Recently I heard about a couple in Germany, white as snow, who had a dark skinned baby nobody could explain. Twins, I believe, one white, one colored. But I don't know if it's true. All I know is that for me, nursing her was like having a picnic something I did. I went to bottle feeding soon as I got home. My husband, Lewis, is a porter, and when he got back off the rails, he looked at me like I was really crazy, and looked at her like she was from the planet Jupiter. He wasn't a cussing man, so when he said, God damn it, what the hell is this? I knew we were in trouble. That's what did it. What caused the fights between me and him? It broke our marriage to pieces. We had three good years together. But when she was born, he blamed me and treated Lula Ann like she was a stranger. More than that, an enemy. He never touched her. 
I never did convince him that I ain't never, ever fooled around with another man. He was dead sure I was lying. We argued and argued till I told him her blackness must be from his own family, not mine. That's Toni Morrison reading from her new novel, God Help the Child. So the mother distances herself from the daughter because of the daughter's dark skin. The father leaves thinking this child must not be his because he too is lighter skinned. And that sets the whole story in motion. And I'm wondering why you chose um, color, you know, the, the level of blackness as a central part of the story. Well, I wanted to separate color from grace. Uh, distinguishing color, light, black, in between, as the marker for race is really an error. It's socially constructed, it's culturally enforced, and it has some advantages for certain people. But this is really uh, skin privilege. The ranking of color in terms of its closeness to white people or white skinned people and its devaluation according to how dark it is. And the impact that has on people who are dedicated to uh, the privileges of certain levels of skin color. So, were there times in your life when you've been exposed to that kind of um, hierarchy of color within the African American community? I have. I didn't have it until I went away to college. I didn't know there was this kind of preference. But I noticed, uh, in addition to the outside world of Washington, D.C., which at that time, this is 1949, 1950, there were very obvious stated written differences between what white people were able to do and what black people were able to do. But on the campus where I felt safe uh, and welcome, I began to realize that this idea of the lighter, the better, and the darker or worse was really um, and it had an impact on sororities, on friendships, on all sorts of things. And it was stunning to me. And you went to a traditionally African American college at Howard University. Yes. So what effect did that have on you? And where, where did people see you? Where did people perceive you as fitting in in that? Um, hierarchy of color. I don't know. I really don't know. I um, had some very... I thought the whole thing was a little theatrical. None of that seemed real. Um, I left... I was an English major, we'll say. And I went into the drama department with the Howard Players because they, A, read literature differently from the way it was discussed in a class. And also, the criteria for excellence had nothing to do with color. It had only to do with talent. And that was a different environment, one in which I thought, well, I did, actually. I thought in that kind of way. There was a New York Times Magazine cover story about you recently, and in that article you describe when you were young, witnessing your father throw a white man down the stairs because your father thought this man was coming up the stairs after his daughters. Was your father afraid that this man was coming to abuse you and your sister? I think he felt so. Too. I think his own experience in Georgia um, would have made him think that any white man bumbling up the stairs uh, toward an apartment was not there for any good. And since we were little girls, he assumed that. I think he made a mistake. I mean, I really think the man was 
drunk. I don't know. Really. To anything else. But the interesting thing was, A, the white man was, he survived. B, the real thing for me was I thought, I felt profoundly protected and defended. Uh, I was not happy because after my father threw him down the steps, all the way out into the street, he threw our tricycle at him. That was a little bit of a problem since we needed our tricycle. But that made me think that there was some devil to it, something evil about the white people, which is exactly what the father thought. He was very, very serious in his hatred of white people. What mitigated it was my mother, who was exactly the opposite, who never rejected or accepted anybody based on race or color, religion or any of that. Everybody was an individual whom she approved of or disapproved of based on her perception of them as individuals. It sounds, you, you said that this uh, incident made you feel protected. It sounds terrifying though for two reasons. One is that your father basically gave you the idea that this man was coming upstairs to do you harm. And two, watching your father not only throw him down the stairs, but throwing your tricycle down the stairs after him, it sounds like that would be a little frightening to see your father. Well, if it was you and a black man was coming up the stairs after a little white girl, and the white father threw a black man down, that wouldn't disturb you. I'm trying to think that through. I guess, you know, I think, My I think father it's a, it's a felt product about of being in this, like, not very violent, uh, working class, middle class family where I didn't, I didn't see a lot of violence when I was growing up. So any violent act um, would probably have been very unnerving to me. Well, <clears throat> it was my father who could do no wrong. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think of it as, oh look, my father is a violent man. He never, you know, spanked us. He never quarreled with us. He never argued with us. He was dedicated and he was sweet. So he did this thing to protect his children. Now I lived in a little working class town that had no black neighborhood at all. One high school, we all played together. Everybody was either somebody from the South or an immigrant from East Europe or uh, from Mexico. And there was one church and there were four elementary schools. And we were all, pretty much, until the end of the war, very, very poor. My neighbors were from, my mother's neighbors who brought her stuffed cabbage, were from Czechoslovakia, what used to be called Czechoslovakia. So that I'm not at all a person who has been reared or raised in a community in which these racial lines were that pronounced occasionally as children. We might figure out how to call somebody a name and they would figure out how to call us. But it wasn't, it was, it was so light, it was so fluffy. I didn't really have a strong awareness of segregation and the separation of races until I left Lorraine. You know, I thought the whole world was like Lorraine. I think it must have been hard for your father to hate white people or only to live in a neighborhood and there was a lot of white people. Well, you know, my father saw two black men lynched on his street in Cartersville, Georgia, as a child. And I think seeing two black businessmen, not vagrants, hanging from trees, as a child, was traumatic for him. You know, another theme in your book is how, you know, parents can mess up their children and how, as one character puts it, how childhood cuts 
festered and never scabbed over. And I know you're writing this as an older woman, but when you were younger and first became a parent, were you very worried that you'd mess up, that you'd do something that was unknowingly terribly, terribly wrong? I don't mean something as extreme as what happens to the characters here. But I think so many parents worry that they're going to inadvertently do something that scars their child. I never worried about what's going to happen when I you know, lived among my family and then just myself too. When I went to school, I never did think that I would hurt my child. Why was going on? Afterwards, I remember every Every word I spoke that was wrong, that was content, every form of when I did not protect them properly. Now that I'm 84, I remember everything as a mistake, and I regret everything. Now, mind you, one of them is now deceased, one is now deceased. So I don't have any reason for this except for her stage of the regret. But I always thought I was able to accommodate all of my friends. Yeah, I want to say your younger son died of pancreatic cancer. I'm very sorry to hear about that. That was a few years ago when he was born. Yes. Why do you think that later in life you started focusing on everything you thought you perhaps did wrong? I guess I'm depressed. I don't know. <laughs> I can't explain it. Part of it is the. Uh, irritability of being 84 and part of it is being um, not as physically strong as I once was and part of it is my misunderstanding I think of what's going on in the world and so writing for me is a big protection but when I'm not creating or focusing on something I can imagine or invent I think I go back over my life I don't recommend this, by the way. And you pick up, oh, what did you do that for? Why didn't you understand this? Not just with children, as a parent, but with other people, with friends. So it's a long period. It's not profound regret. It's just a wiping of a tiny little messes that you didn't recognize. <laughs> well, this reminds me of a couple of lines from your novel that I want to read. And this is, um, you know, the main character, the woman who was born with a very dark skin and grows into being like very, very beautiful and has her own cosmetics line and everything. At one point, I don't want to give away too much of the actual story, but at one point she, she, she's in an accident and breaks her foot, so she's kind of immobilized. And so she's thinking, Helpless, idle. It became clear to Bride, Bride is her name, it became clear to Bride why boredom was so bored again. Without distraction or physical activity, the mind shuffled, pointless, scattered recollections were round and round. And that strikes me as like what you're talking about when you're not writing, when your mind is idle, that it just kind of goes through the shuffle of thoughts, <laughs> in your case, negative thoughts, <laughs> that you, you dwell on in a way that you prefer not to. It's true. It's true. And then, you know, I'd, when you reach a certain age, you know, it's a very, very close friend of my, my dad. And others are far away. So you narrow down your acquaintances, the ones that mean a lot to you. Uh, I have my sister, who's a year and a half older, and of course, my own son and grandchildren. But it gets us, you're in a smaller world, person. And so there is this boredom or the absence of something to do. I mean, I don't work. I keep telling people I'm on the floor. And I don't wash dishes and I don't wash clothes. And I don't clean my house. Somebody else does that. So there's this void. And I think you're absolutely what you pull, what you can pull, 
if you're an irritable old lady, into that void is every uh, misstep, wrong word. Why didn't you visit? Why didn't you do this? It's, you know, the opposite of that is when you get to a certain age in this whole world and you begin to remember every hurt somebody did to you. That never happens to me. Why not? Because I, li- I kind of think you could hold both thoughts in your mind at the, at the same time and run through all the hurt you've created while at the same time running through all the things that people have done to you that have hurt me. <laughs> One does not preempt the other. <laughs> I think I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> My guest is Toni Morrison. Her new novel is called God Help the Child. After we take a short break, she'll talk about why she now needs a wheelchair to get around and about how her physical limitations are affecting her activities and her thoughts. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. And now we'd like to thank one of our sponsors who helped make today's program possible.